Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 76. I'm Anita Helm from Resurrection Baptist Church. Tonight, I put on the title of What Kind of Worker Are You? And you saw the cute little milkshake Mandy and her head was laying on her desk and her coffee cup was on her side. And it says, can't talk now, I'm working and she's out cold. Well, that's a play on some fun, but I wanna have a serious conversation. But before I started, I wanted to give recognition to somebody that was has been very important in my younger life and has influenced me every day of my life because of who he introduced to me. As a young child, I think I've shared with some of you that I lost my father very early in life through cancer. And during those middle school years, it was kind of tough. I mean, imagine somebody 10 or 11 losing their father to cancer and then finding out that in, in middle school, I was gonna be teased, called stuff and puff because I happened to be bestowed with these big bosoms. And so you had that and you had bullying for other reasons and, and just the transition of being a kid transitioning into a younger woman. Anyway, upon my life, there came this postcard in the mail to mom and care of her, but it was to me. And basically it was an invitation to be a part of Your House Incorporated in Leesburg, Virginia which was a Christian youth group that was recently being started at that time in the early 80s. And the people behind that, the co-founders of that was William and Diana Lee. And they were a normal couple, former teachers of Loudoun County High School. And because of their heart for young people knowing Jesus Christ, I was a part and my cousins and other teenagers all over Loudoun County and they took us all over the place to beaches and we went to Miami and we went to all kinds of places. But I'm not talking about that because of the things that he and Mrs. Lee showed me that I could do many times over now as an adult. I'm telling you this in the beginning of My Milkshake Monday because of their heart, I was able to understand and recognize the importance of Jesus Christ not as some faraway person and no spooky God or anything like that, but they personalized him to a point that I just didn't see him for in church on Sunday. I saw him as a, a person in my life that I've grown to love and find him priceless. And I just want to recognize Mr. Lee because he's gone on to be with the Lord through a car accident and he didn't make it to see 2020. He um, died on December 31st. But I wanted to say that I am grateful to God for the Lees and their sacrifice and all the people who are laborers in this harvest that Christ said is truly plentiful and ripe. And I just wanted to let you all know that I know within my heart, without a shadow of a doubt, that when he was absent from the body to be present with the Lord, that the Lord shared with him, well done, thy good and faithful servant, because he was one of many that took the call of Jesus Christ and to share that great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. He took it seriously. And tonight, as I celebrate his life, I also want to talk about what kind of worker are you? Now, this past Sunday, we had a wonderful teaching. Uh, Sister Laverne Carter taught about a peace, having peace of mind in a troubled world. And after we finished that, we were buzzing. It was great teaching. And I needed to stop by a store and I went to a Walmart. I'm not doing any plug for Walmart. But as I was going in, I said, there's something going on that on Sunday, Walmart is packed. That you can't even get through the parking lot. I see children, I see our youth ministries. I see our young adult ministries. I see our senior ministries. I see everybody going into Walmart. Like it's a utopia. Like everything and all the answers are in Walmart. You're not going to find them in church, kids, but you can find it in Walmart and there may be a rollback special and maybe they'll say, attention all Walmart shoppers, there's something there for you all to learn. But you know what? If all we can tell our children is that they can find everything they need in Walmart, we have woefully failed them because you can't find all that you need for $4.99 coming from another country. Our lives are not for us to get more stuff. Our lives are to share who Jesus Christ is to young 
and old and everybody in between. So tonight I'm going to be talking about what kind of worker are you? And I'm going to list out a few types and then I'm going to dig deep in a couple of them. Now, you can go from Genesis to Revelation and they're all types of people. And they're all types of people that say they love Jesus Christ and they're Christians and all kinds of behaviors are going on. And you're like, hmm, but Christ has that scripture in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 says, Jesus is telling his disciples, the, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. So even though he has a lot of people who are supposedly working, it's like Milkshake Mandy. Everybody says they're working, but they're not working as unto the Lord and working with the knowledge of what Christ wants us to do in the Great Commission. But they're doing things that seem right in their own sight. So I just want to give you a few examples all in the Bible. I can't do them all. That would take all night. But I just want to give you a few examples for you to think about. Now, let's imagine you got the rich. Nobody says anything's wrong with being rich. But think about the rich young ruler who comes to Christ bragging and say, I've done everything. You can't find nothing I have done. I'm so good. He's the kind of worker that thinks he's just perfect until Christ says one thing you lack. That's one example. The worker that thinks they all that in a bag of chips and they really have done everything. It's the other people that haven't measured up. And then you have our wonderful brother, Peter. Peter has been walking with Jesus for three long years in ministry. And he says, if everybody leaves you, God, I'm going to be with you because he knows himself better than God. And he tells God, you don't know what you're talking about, Lord. We got some workers like that. They done been in ministry for a few years and they just think they know. They know more than God, they think, until God reveals to them their true disposition, their true their true core, their true, you really about yourself and protecting yourself. Well, that's Peter. Well, you have a few people like the 10 lepers where only one comes back and the other nine take off and show everybody how they heal, but don't give credit and don't praise the Lord Jesus Christ who healed them. You got some ungrateful workers. They'll take all they can for the blessings of God, but they're ungrateful. And that's, God said, were there not 10? And in the church house, were there not 10 and only one grateful worker? Grateful to come back and at least say thank you? Well, let's see all the healings and resurrections they have. We had Lazarus, who was a great friend, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And we have Jairus' son, and we have the woman with the issue of blood. And you have all of these things where Christ showed miracles. And we don't hear a lot, but let's just believe that they did some work. Because a lot of us will pray for God to heal us. For God to get us out of that situation, for God to take us from looking up in the ceiling in the hospital bed, in our sick bed, and as soon as we get up on our feet, I ain't got time to go to worship. I ain't got time to go to church until the next time we find ourselves with our backs on the head of our pillows. Well, look at Joseph. We got some incarcerated workers. You know, in, in, in jail, you find that people get sensitive in jail and in the hospital. Joseph was incarcerated, but, and then he got promoted out of the jail, but to, he didn't forget God. But we got a lot of people that are incarcerated and sensitive, but then when they get free out of the jail cell, they put themselves back in the bondage of going back with the same old, same old, same old, and they get into the bondage. And instead of working for the Lord as they promised, Get me out of this, Lord, as they promised. Their little red cars and their little blue cars and their buddies and they're kicking it and the pants is back down again. They ain't got time to work. Well, let's think of Samson. We got workers that are skirt chasers. Hey, I'm going to do what I want, but oh my God, that baby look good. That stuff over there look good. They're skirt chasers. Their focus is on the flesh until something dramatic happens to turn them back around and say, God, give me the strength. Give me the strength. Well, you also have doubters. We always talk about doubting Thomas, but we got lots of doubters in the church. That's evidenced by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They all knew the Bible, but they doubted that it was true. And some people come to church every Sunday, come to the worship services for Bible study and prayer meeting, but they still doubt. Does he really mean that I have to give? Does he really mean that I have to go? Does he really mean that I have to do what he wants me to do? They're no different than Doubting Thomas, but they're a little bit uppity. They think they got something better. 
Well, let's see about those people that think they can tell Jesus what to do. Even Mama Mary, they ain't got no wine. Son, they ain't got no wine. Let me tell the pastor what you got to do. You got all kinds of workers. Well, you got adulterer workers. You, you saw that a few times. A woman at the well had five husbands and the one she was with wasn't hers. You saw the woman caught in the very act of adultery. So adultery is not something new, but look what both of those women did. Even though they were caught, one went to the town and told, come see a man. So you can't discount people because they fail. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but every worker don't start off at a certain place that you think they should be. They're starting off where the Holy Spirit finds them and it catches hold of them. And they're serious about this relationship with Christ. Well, you can think of, this is the one I hear all the time. Excuse I this, Moses, I can't go. My tongue don't work right. I got a stuttering problem. I can't do that because I got this issue. God, you can't really expect me because I got this issue. I got the job. I got to go, go to my second job, my third job. I'm tired. I just can't do. Or you got crying Hezekiah. He's sick. And he just crying. Give me more time. For what? You crying for God to heal you for more time for you to do your own thing? God said, I keep giving you time so you can come back and repent. So those are just examples. I could go and say, you got Christians that are Zacchaeus. They'll go up a tree for Jesus. Short in stature as he was, he'd go up a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. They'll do whatever they need to to see Jesus. You got the Saul types that started out strong for the wrong cause. And God had to say, you're working against me. You're kicking against the pricks. I need you to be on my side. There's all kinds of examples of workers. But I want you to ask yourself before tonight, before you close your eyes tonight, I want you to ask God, what kind of worker are you? Ask him, because he wants to tell you, because some of us think we are great workers for the Lord. We're great laborers for the Lord. But again, God's word teaches us there are going to be some that present themselves before the holy God at the time of judgment and say, didn't I do this for you, Lord? And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And you don't want to find that out when you've already taken your last natural breath. But I want to share with you some examples in the scripture because a lot of us, us's, us's who say we are Christians are playing games. You remember that old expression? I'm a cuss, so y'all who tell the young kids to put their hands over the older people because the young people say everything and worse. So you, you older people, y'all the ones. But you remember that expression, you don't give a damn? You remember that expression? We don't got it. Now the kids say we don't give an F. But there was a time when we used to use that expression because you would mean that you don't care about anything. And we use the expression, you don't give a damn, because even if it means your damnation to hell, you don't care. You have no regard for God. So then the older folks said, you know what? You don't give a damn. But now we don't even want to say damn, because that means what's damn? What's hell? What's fire? Who's Jesus? People... Our children know more about Walmart and all they can find in Walmart from the McDonald's, from the tax, from the nails, from the this, from the bank. They know more about Walmart than they know about Jesus Christ and the word of God. How many of you, if you went through somebody boiling you like John in Patmos and Revelation would say, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm bored. I done been to the burn unit. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wilted. I look a mess. I'm, I'm hurting. I'm, I'm struggling. Y'all say, I'm done. God, of course, doesn't expect anything more from me. I have been disabled. I don't have no more to give. Let the healthy people do it. If a man was boiled alive, he was disabled. He is disabled. Revelation that he wrote out of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that was a man that was disabled, boiled alive. But even though he was boiled alive and lived, he said, God, I want to be used. And God used him. So every excuse that we can put up tonight to say we old, we sick, we don't know, we can't talk, we're not preachers, we all that stuff is excuses. But you better ask yourself tonight, I pray to God, what kind of worker are you for the Lord Jesus Christ? We're going to have probably only two examples because I, I know about your time. And I know everybody got time for 
a two and a half, three hour movie. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, y'all get a little bit uh, distracted. So we're going to go to an example of someone who was a worker. And they start in the very beginning of the Bible. I won't read the whole story of Genesis 4. Cain was the first son of Adam and Eve. He was a farmer, tiller of the ground. That's what that means. His brother deal with stock. What the story shows is that when it was time to give unto God the first fruits, you know, tithes and offerings, where it says, will a man rob God? We rob him all the time because we don't want to give our first fruits. If it's a dollar, he asked for 10 cents, a dime, and you say, I want the whole dollar. I don't want to give my 10. I don't want to give above and beyond the 10 or offerings. So in this case, this is the first offerings that you're seeing that the father's getting from Cain and Abel. Cain is giving God his offering of his produce, the lamb. And God does not regard it. It, it doesn't have any favor. He doesn't respect it. But on the other hand, he respects the fat of the lamb, the fat of the animals that Abel's given. And the attitude change of Cain is what we find in the workers today. You give something, but you always want to get a pat on the back. Why would God give you a pat on the back the way you're working? The way you're not working. The way you have working. You, you, you got to understand, I don't say this because I'm a, a woman that's married to a pastor. I could have said this when I was 20. I could have said it when I was 30. I'm saying it now because I want you to ask the question of God. What kind of worker are you? Because you don't want to find that he's going to say, you, you're working in vain because you're not working for me. You're working for yourself. And Cain is giving an offering, but he's not giving it the way God wants it given. And God's not going to take half-step mess. He wants our best. He doesn't want our mess. And a lot of us are giving messed up work. Come to church late. Don't feel like praising. Don't feel like really coming. Don't feel like giving. Don't feel like fellowshipping. If I want you to sing, give me the paper. What's that song you want? I don't want to sing that. You've been singing it for 20 years, haven't taken time to learn it. I don't want to sing it today. I don't want to give my last $10. I got things to do with it. But don't you? Doesn't God bless you with that new job? I don't want to come to church. I got other things to do better than church. And if I come, you better be grateful I'm coming. That's the kind of attitude. But I, that didn't just happen in 2020. Look at what happened with Cain. So it says in verse 4 of chapter 4, Abel, okay, let's start at three. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So Amplified Bible talks about he got depressed. He was disappointed, but he was very angry. He was ticked. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? I respect you, Cain, what you do right. I respect you workers of the Lord in 2020, if you do right. Y'all think you're gonna phone in your, your relationship and your work for the Lord. I'm gonna tell y'all something in advance because I was gonna tell you when I get to Lydia. You can't serve God before you worship God. You can try to serve God and you'll quit. You'll try to serve God without worshiping and respecting as Lord. And you'll find that you'll start doing anything the way you want to do it. Because in reality, when you start to serve God without knowing God and worshiping God, loving God, you'll be just like Satan and Lucifer, where you want the accolades to be, the recognition, the respect, the favor to be on you. And you want to get the praise on you. And it's never about you. If they never say, thank you, sister, thank you, brother, for doing a great program, thank you for spending all those hours doing it, if they never say one word, mm, you didn't do it for them. You didn't do it for the program. You didn't do it for the, the money the program's going to be. You didn't do it for the people coming in. You did it for the work of the Lord, to the worship of the Lord, to glorify who gave you life, who gave you forgiveness, who gave you eternity. But when you get your feelings hurt, uh, 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 Cain, when you get your attitude and your countenance starts to fall because the pastor forgot your name, because that committee that you served and sweat on, you didn't get recognized, you got to wonder, 
Were you trying to elevate yourself or are you elevating the things of God? And that's exactly what happened to Cain. And when you say that, you have to look at what God says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, if your attitude is funky because you got your priorities wrong in your work, you're not in the worship of giving, the worship of serving God, the worship of realizing that it's all about his son and glorifying his son. If you do not do well, this is what happens with Satan. It says, and if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And guess what? Cain decided that he didn't need to listen to God. I don't need to hear from you, God. You like Abel's stuff better. And guess what? He says, come on, brother, in verse eight, come on, we need to talk because he's pissed. He's disappointed. He can't touch God, but he can touch his brother and he can kill his brother. And some of the workers in the household of faith are killing each other with that tongue because you want the recognition from God for work that you're really not doing for God. You're doing it for yourself. Well, let's go on to Acts chapter 16. That was an example of work that was given, offering that was given, that wasn't given as unto the Lord, it was given unto the self. Acts chapter 16 demonstrates what I shared about you have to worship God first before you work. What happens with people is they think if they work enough, if you see them killing themselves at the church house enough, that somehow God's going to say, oh, I deserve, oh, they deserve, oh, sister and brother, they deserve to go into heaven because they work, they work themselves to the bone. It's never about your work, it's about your faith. It's about your worship of Christ. The thief on the cross didn't have time to be an auxiliary or write a program or get, get something together. It's about faith and worship of the holy God of Jesus Christ and believing he is the true and living God, the one true and living God, and he's there at the right hand of God the Father. You can't talk to people about faith if all you're doing is trying to work yourself to earn it. That's not how it works, saints. So let's go to verse six, thir chapter 16 of Acts, verse 13. Paul got rerouted to be here because God recognized there was a harvest here. And he knew that at this stage of the game, Saul, who became Paul and was dedicated and committed, he was, he was sold about the worship of Christ. He said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus Christ. And he says, he does what Christ asked him. And he meets this harvest of these women. But look what it says in verse 13. It says, and on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So you got some women who are worshiping. And they say they're praying. They're customarily coming to the riverside to pray. If you know God, you're going to want to talk to God. You're going to want to worship God. You're going to want to pray to the Father, to adore the Father. Now verse 14 says, now a certain woman, here's a worker here. But she ain't just no worker for worker's sake. It says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. You know, last week I talked about an intervention for people who don't want to listen. Lydia is paying attention and she's hearing, not with just the ear, she's hearing with the heart and she's paying attention to the spirit of God that's being spoken through Paul. It says, and she heard us in verse 14. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. Y'all got that? She worshiped God. Yes, yeah, she had a business. She was an entrepreneur, but on a Sunday, a Sabbath, even though she had a job, a J-O-B, and she had a lot of business, on Sunday, she took the time to worship God on the riverside. She wasn't in the big edifice of the building. She was on the riverside praying, and it said customarily. She ain't one of these dippers. I'll be there this Sunday. I won't be there next Sunday. I'll get there at 11 this Sunday. Maybe I'll get there at 1.30 the next Sunday. She customarily was on time at the Riverside for prayer because she worshiped God. Am I upset? I'm not upset. I'm not upset, gang. I ain't upset. I ain't got a heaven or hell to get you. I just want to share with you 
This Melchizedek is thick. And it says, it says she worshiped God. It said the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So you tell me that God's Holy Spirit don't want you to heed because you're in 2020. He wants you to hear the word, but don't want you to do the word. He wants you to hear the word and then you're going to go do whatever the hell you want. Right? That's the plan? Nah, brah. No, sister. God wants you to heed the voice of the Holy Spirit that's drawing you. Because if you're doing work just for yourself, if you're tired and exhausted because God has called you to do something, God will give you the strength. I can tell you because I tell you there's days I wouldn't have the strength. When, I, when things get done, I was like, thank you, Lord. My husband's praying for strength because there's only God and the Holy Spirit that will keep me up to do some of this stuff. But it says here, verse 15 says, and when she and her household were baptized, some of our houses are getting baptized. Some of our people in our house, in our neighborhood, and our co-workers, all the people that we see on the store, some of the people we see in and talking to, they ain't really into what she's saying because it's all about you working and it ain't about you worshiping the God. Then do the work. You got to know the God who we serve before you start doing the work. And it says here, it says, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, there's hospitality in operation. She had to worship God, had to be in prayer, and then she found herself wanting to be hospitable and begging people. How many of y'all begging? I tell you, I can count on the number of my hand, the houses I've eaten food in. Not to say you got to feed me, but how is it that we are not hospitable enough anymore that we're willing to have people even come over our house to have a peanut butter jelly sandwich? Oh, you can't see my house. It's too dirty. Oh, I can't have you looking and judging me. We're not hospitable because we're so focused on the external stuff instead of worrying about the internal stuff. God don't care what your house looks like, but he does want you to share the truth of God's message. And guess what? That's not always going to be in the church house. It can sometimes be on your porch. It sometimes, God forbid, can be found at your dining room table. There's a lot of kids going hungry. There's a lot of kids in your neighborhood that probably would love a, a nice Kool-Aid drink and you talking to them about Jesus. All right, it says here at the end, it says here, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house. Come to my house and stay. Oh my God, you mean you're gonna have one of those Two or three extra bedrooms used for somebody other than your kids and grandchildren? Other than you renting it out to make some extra money? Come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. I'm going to leave you with the Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Because that's what set it off for me. I say that tagline not because I think it's a cute thing to say. I'm just telling what Christ says that there's plenty of people that need to know the Lord. I, I saw a whole lot of hundreds of them just going to Walmart. I could have said Target. I could have said the mall. I could have said the grocery store. I could have said the gas station. I could have said the movie theater. I could have said every restaurant that you can imagine. The harvest is truly plentiful, saints of God, the living God. You're telling me your churches are empty. Well, why are you looking for saints inside a church when they're out there? The fish are in the ocean. They're not outside of the ocean. You got to go in fishing. You got to have your pole ready. You got to go out and fish. They're not going to jump in coming to a church mm -hmm. and they don't even know what church is. Really? Christ was talking to people all over the place at the well, us walking. You got to be ready to share the message of Jesus no matter where you are, no matter where you are. And guess what? You may not always have it in the house of God. We're spending millions on these buildings and the buildings are not saving anybody. If we would just start to share the gospel, worship and pray, and that doesn't need some fancy building. Everybody keeps saying, oh, we can't go to resurrection because they don't, they don't have the building. They're not, pro really? Is that what it's about for you? The building. Because the building ain't going nowhere. When God calls uh, the rapture, he didn't say that he's calling no building up, y'all. He didn't say he's bringing no building up. So anyway, let's go to verse 35 through 38 and we'll end this. 
Then Jesus went up about all the cities and villages. Here, when you say, I don't know what to do, Anita. Once God tells me that I'm not doing any work, what do I do? The Great Commission says, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Well, how does that happen, Nita? Let's go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. What did Jesus do in all those cities and villages? Could be your street, could be at your grocery store, could be at your job. He said, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Start by first studying the word, praying. God will lead you. The Holy Spirit will lead you to what he wants you to do for the sake of the name of Jesus. He's going to testify of Jesus. He's going to show you what kind of work he wants you to do. But first, you have to first be his and repent and have a relationship so that you're worshiping God. You're praying to God. Then you're able to study the word of God. Then you're able to teach and let him lead you. It says here in verse 36, I'm ending it. But when he saw the multitudes, there's multitudes to be seen, y'all, in your city, on your street, uh, oh, there's multitudes to be seen if you open your eyes. He was moved. If we will give a damn about these people, we will be moved with compassion like Christ. Look what it says. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Your children, your children's friends, all of these people that are falling apart, drinking, drugging, sexing, all of the stuff going on, they are weary and they're scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And then he says the key thing, verse 37. Then this is Jesus. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray. You don't know what to do. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Guess what? You're not listening to me by accident. You're not. You could have been anywhere. You are listening because we need you to labor for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need you to change. 2020, you can't do the same old, same old. I know you're afraid to talk to the stranger. You're afraid that you don't know enough. You're afraid that what are they gonna say? What if they spit in your face and they reject you? That's okay. He said they will reject us, but they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the message of Christ. But guess what? There are some people that may reject you in this season, but somebody will come back and water what that seed you put in there and they may Come to know the Lord. My brother was praying for me. And believe me, baby, I rejected it. I didn't want nothing to do with my brother and that Jesus he was talking about giving me no Durham Bible in 1979 for no Christmas gift. I didn't like it and I didn't receive it. But guess what? When the leaves got to me and started telling me, if it's tonight, are you going to know? Is God going to know you? He, had, My brother had planted that seed. I didn't like it and I didn't reject it and he didn't see no fruit from what he said, but he told me and it was days, weeks, months, years later, somebody watered that seed because he convicted me. I wasn't in the place where I was playing church. I had been baptized, going to church, singing for church, ushering for church, serving chickens for church, all that stuff. I wasn't real. But when God saw fit to have another laborer come and water that seed, God be glory. God, I thank God because somebody was willing to labor. And because of that labor, I got introduced to the most priceless gift of the Lord Jesus Christ that I've had since I've been little. To me, middle school and high school is little. And I'm older. And there's not a person, whether it's Reverend Hill, whether it's my mother, whether it's my daughters, whether it's my friends, my family, my church member family, None of them can compare with the priceless gift of knowing who Jesus Christ is. That's how important he is. And he needs truthfully for us to be workers in the Lord Jesus Christ every day. So you have an assignment tonight. You got to ask God the question, what kind of worker are you? I shook the table enough tonight. I don't know if it's me shaking it or God shaking it, but you got to ask God tonight, what kind of worker are you? What kind of worker does he see you as? Because we can all puff ourselves up like Peter. 
because we've walked with Jesus for a long time. But you got to ask him, God, tell me what kind of worker am I and what do you want me to be? How do you want me to grow? How do you want me to start transforming into the woman and the, the man of God that you want me to do so that I can start sharing the message of God so the harvest will start to be coming in and these people won't be so weary and scattered because they'll have the shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants us to be workers for him. It's time to stop playing games. I thank God for you and I pray, Lord willing, to see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Love you.